Okay. Uh, go ahead and let me know how the audio levels are feeling for you guys. Not 100% sure how, uh, I, I had kind of had to, like, refix my setup because I, my apartment has super awful, uh, internet, so I'm actually set up in the office today. Um, if there's anything wrong with the audio, feel free to let me know. Uh, but other than that, welcome to the lecture series. Uh, Dr. Drake, of course, is feeling a lot better. We managed to locate his head. Uh, we're still shy a leg, but otherwise he's in good spirits. Um, so hopefully he'll be back in the history department soon. I, of course, am your uh, guest professor. Um, you may know me from the cryptology department. Uh, they kind of called me in for this one because I don't really have an outside job. I just kind of learn things for a living. So they already knew I had a deep understanding of this particular topic. So welcome to Alaska History 101. I, of course, am the professor of cryptozoology uh, Stickador, Sticky Gooberson, you can go, go ahead and call me just Sticky. Um, hi! Like I said, if, if there's anything wrong with the audio, let me know. So, let's go ahead and hop right into it. We're going to start with where Alaska comes into the, into American, uh, oh, peaking a bit, okay. I can fix that. How's how's that? Is that any better? Sick. Okay. Um. So we're gonna start with where Alaska becomes American property. Um. Before this, there's a good 100 to 200 years worth of history, but in order to cover all of that. Um, in order to cover all of that, we'd have to be looking at beginning with Russian expansion, and I figured we'd just cover the super basic. So we're going to be covering a small window of time in Alaskan history from where it comes into a U.S. territory to right up until uh, statehood and a little bit after that. Um, if it's a topic that after today's lecture you find that you're really interested in, I highly recommend going through and doing a little bit of research on your own. Uh, there are several great books that talk about Alaska during the territory days and early statehood. Uh, these, it's a wonderful topic and I really hope it kind of gets you guys in, excited for history, if that makes sense. So let's go ahead and hop in to Becoming an American uh, of course, Alaska is purchased from Russia in 1867. Uh, this was delayed due to the American Civil War. Um, they had originally intended to sell the property around 1865. Um, however, at that time, it's where we... It's, it's the lead up to the Civil War, so there's a lot of civil unrest. Uh, Russia at the time sees that they aren't quite sure which way America is going. So rather than sell them the property and not know who it is that they're going to be selling the property to, they decided to wait until after the war. So that way they would be able to know which government it is they're dealing with, whether it's the Confederate States or if the Union was going to pull the Southern States back in. Um, the property was purchased for $7.2 million. If we adjust for inflation, we're looking at just over hundred or well just under 128 million dollars uh, later on when gold is discovered in Amer in Alaska we would pull out several times that amount in gold revenue um, a lot of people know when when you talk about Alaska there's the whole Seward's folly thing where is where people were saying that it was viewed as a negative idea why do we need this property out in the middle of nowhere. Why is it necessary to purchase this off of Russia? Um, this was actually played up by uh, newspapers at the time. 
a majority of Americans saw this as a good thing because we're still coming off of the westward expansion of America. So we are getting additional property. Um, because of this, people actually viewed the purchase of Alaska as positive. That doesn't make for good newspaper uh, stories, though. So it was played up in the papers as Seward's Folly, saying that everybody was against this idea and they had no idea why they wanted uh, the purchase of the state. Uh, the first territorial legislature will happen in 1913. Um, Alaska has a lot of war history where it's, it's very strategically placed because of where it is that during World War I and World War II, it will become a vital area for uh, Pacific theater. Um, the, lecture, uh, the first legislature happens in the Elk Lodge, which is actually down the road. Uh, it's, it's still here. Uh, there, I've got pictures in here somewhere of the legislature uh, from, from that because picture, uh, photography had become a thing by then. Uh, speaking of which, uh, the first Territorial House of Representatives, um, if you'll notice, the flag on, in this picture is very off. Um, that's because this is a 46 star flag. At the time, Arizona and New Mexico had just joined the Union, and the 48 star flags had not been issued out to the territories yet. So at the time of this photo, they were using a 46 star flag. And this was the Senate. Um, this is one that when I have tour groups that I go th that come through, I particularly like to point out specifically because this dude looks like Jeff from Rooster Teeth. Um, it, like every time I walk by this picture while I'm at work, I see it. I see him, and I'm just like, "That's that's Jeff." Um, so this is the federal ca slash Capitol building. Um, at the time. Um, we had enough, we, so there's a lot of stuff going on with this particular building because it starts off as the federal building for the territory. Um, as we'll get into later, there's a lot of stuff like in terms of getting the property to put the, uh, the building on, uh, the use of materials for the building um, because of how much it costs. Later on, they're going to decide that rather than building a brand new capital building, they're going to instead repurpose the federal building. So the the capital building now is the old federal building from before we gained statehood. Uh, it's only one of 10 buildings in the nation to be without a dome. That's be speci specifically because this building was the original uh, federal building, not the not intended to be the Capitol building. Um, the others, of course, being Florida, Louisiana, New Mexico, New York, Delaware, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Virginia. Um, it started, of course, as the territorial building, as we mentioned before. After statehood, it becomes the Capitol building. Um, the Capitol building, so the Capitol building is required to have a mail room on the first floor and accessible by the road. Uh, the way the federal building was built, the uh, mail room is accessible by the road, but it's on the second floor. Um, Juneau is a very hilly area, so it sits on a very steep incline, and the way the building had been put into the hill, you can drive up to the second floor and gain access from there. Um, so rather than moving the mail room down a floor, they renamed the floors accordingly. So you start at the ground floor, and you and the building goes up from there. So it goes ground one, two, three, and so on. Um, so this building only goes as high as the fifth floor, but it's a six story building. Uh, funds, were for, funds for the building were appropriated in 1911. Um, they, however, did not have, an, the funds that they appropriated weren't enough to pay for the entire city block that was needed for the building. Now, I don't have, I don't have concrete proof of this. I did some 
some digging. Uh, this is one of the legends surrounding the building. Um, but it's one of those things that it's talked about. I can't substantiate. I can't like provide you with concrete proof. So I ask that you take this with a grain of salt. Um, a lot of stuff you'll see in Alaskan history, uh, concrete proof is really difficult to find. Um, so the rest of the funds were raised by locals. We know that for a fact. Um, the story goes that it was raised by a bake sale that the locals in Juneau got together and had a giant bake sale to raise the money needed for the rest of the city block necessary for uh, building the capital or building the federal building. Um, whether or not that's true, I haven't managed to find any solid proof. Um, it's just one of those urban legend kind of deals. The construction starts in 1929 and is finished by 1931, and it's dedicated on Valentine's Day, uh, the in the thir on in 1931. Um, recently, as in the, as in the late 2010s, uh, the building was er earthquake proofed. They went through and they put a concrete shell inside of the building to prevent massive damage to the building in the event of a, of a really large earthquake. Um, all of the materials, including the marble, for building the Capitol building came from the state itself. So the marble actually comes from Prince of Wales Island, which is out on the Aleutian chain, I believe. Um, I can't I can't say 100% sure where Prince of Wales is, but I know it's in, in Amer Alaskan territory. Or, well, it's an Alaskan island. Um, so, because we're discussing Alaska, it's only right that we discuss gold. Um, gold has a major impact on Alaska's economy from the very start. Um, for the purposes of the lecture today, however, we're only going to be talking about three major ones. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Klondike Gold Rush, um, the Juno Gold Rush and the Gnome Gold Rush. Um, there are several gold rushes that happen within this territory. These three in particular hold historical significance for us. So we'll start with the Klondike. The Klondike Gold Rush was started when gold was discovered in Yukon, Canada. Um, because of the way of the location of it, the only real way to get in there was to, to go through the Chilkoot Pass or the White Pass. In order to get to those passes, though, you had to go through either Daiya or Skagway. Um, when gold is first discovered there, Canada immediately sends uh, mounted police up there to rein in the area because it's it's far out in the middle of nowhere. They don't want to see lawlessness take over, so they're very quick to have a presence established up there. Um, the American side did not do that. Uh, it very much becomes an, another tale of old, we like the Old West. Um, this leads to a lot of theft and con artists operating in the area stealing gold from prospectors. Uh, this leads us into speaking of Alaska's first con man, uh, Jefferson Randolph Smith II, also known as Soapy Smith. So he operated out of Skagway and had a number of uh, rigged things that he would operate. Um, he was known for operating a telegraph center. Uh, at the time, however, there were no telegraph service, uh, service lines running through Alaska. So essentially what he would do is he'd have his, his guys go up and people would be waiting in line to get through the, uh, the Chilkoot Pass and they'd go up to a, a guy and say, hey, you know, we, we, we have a telegram service set up. You want to send a message home to your, your family so that they know that you're, you're doing okay, like that you got here okay? And they'd say, oh yeah, sure. And so they'd pay them like a dollar and the guy would run off and then a, a little while later, he'd come back with a reply message from the family. Um, these were all falsified telegrams. 
uh, what they would actually do is they would have the people write down the note, they would go back to their quote unquote telegraph office, and they would just sit there and wait. And after a little while, they would write a response telegram and bring it back out to the person and pretend as though it came from that person's family. Um, there was also a lot of rigged gambling. Um, Soapy Smith is actually known for his rigged gambling and muggings as a result of the rigged gambling going awry. <laughs> so one of the, the rigged gambling uh, games that Soapy Smith is known for is uh, it involved bars of soap. And essentially, on the bars of soap, they would have a number written on them. The number was for so much money, and you would just like reach into the bucket, you'd pull out a soap bar, however much was running, what written on the soap bar was how much you won. Um, nine times out of ten, there were no large sums in the bucket to be won. Um, in order to keep people believing that they could potentially win large, however, he would have his own men step in and pretend to be a random citizen and have them win big. So that way he would pass off his the money to somebody that was working for him, and when all was said and done, they'd give the money back. And he'd like pay them for their time. Um, every once in a while, though, somebody did get really lucky and pull a large sum of money out of the soap bucket. Um, when this happened, Soapy would send his men later to mug the person and take the money back. I thought I covered when Soapy Smith dies. Soapy, Soapy dies um, after a particular engagement with a gentleman that did win large and was mugged. Um, after he was mugged, the town was completely fed up with him and they formed a mob. And Soapy ends up getting shot with a shotgun to the chest. Um, the person that was mugged that got the mob together actually ends up dying in the, the crossfire. And uh, He's given a proper, he's actually given like a hero's burial for getting the town together to uh, put Soapy Smith out of business. While Soapy was actually just dumped in a ditch somewhere. Um, I think he just has like an unmarked grave out in Skagway, out in Skagway somewhere. So the Juno Gold Rush, our second one that we're going to be discussing. Um, we're looking, uh, the two gentlemen, Joe Juno and Richard Harris, would discover gold in what would later become Juno, named after uh, after Joe, and further on would actually become the state capital. Um, I believe at the time the, before Juno was established, I believe the capital was Sitka, which is a smaller island uh, closer to the panhandle of, of Alaska. Um, because of this particular gold rush, this is what leads more people to come to the state in search of gold. Um, the one before got people coming to Alaska, but we were more of an intermediary. Is You came through Alaska to get to Canada where the gold was. This one is the one where we discover, oh, hey, there's a lot of gold to be found in Alaska. And this is what starts bringing people up to the, the territory and starts more studies of, of minerals to try and locate more gold. Gnome is going to be our biggest one, however. Um, so this, the gold in Gnome is discovered in 1898 by the three lucky Swedes, uh, John Bertenson, Brentson, Eric Lindbaum, and, who lordy. I think that's Hafet, Hafet Lindberg. They, of course, very quickly established claims up in Nome. Um, it isn't too long after this that we f that uh, word gets out that hey, up in Nome there's gold. Um, Nome was so heavy with gold that there were actually gold nuggets to be found on the beaches. Um, 
a lot of times what we would see happen is if a miner had a, a claim that turned out bunk and he just could not find any guild, uh, gold in his claim, they would go down to the beach and they would mine the beach for gold until they had enough money to get themselves back home again. Um, there was unwritten rules as to how you operated the uh, claim on the uh, on the beach. So you were only mi you only had a claim on the beach as you were actively mining it. If you left the beach, you no longer had a claim to any gold that was dug up in the spot where you were digging. Um, the claims size, and I, I couldn't find an adequate way to really explain this, but a claim size was a man's arm plus his shovel. So if you took your shovel and you held it out and you spun around in a circle, that was your claim size. And I, I like I said, it's it's one of those things where it's it's so odd that explaining it becomes a little bit more difficult. But in essence, that's that's how we see uh, people mining the beaches, and none of this was written into law. It was just kind of expected of somebody who was mining on the beach. You had this much space to work with. If you if you leave the beach, you don't have claim on any gold that was in there anymore, and people would just mine the beach until they had enough that they felt they could go home. Um, some people would actually just use it so they could continue to live in Nome. So why Nome? So this is going to be another one of those instances of uh, no real solid proof. It's more of a local legend. Um, so the local legend is that a cartographer was sent out to map the town of Nome so that it could be added into the registry. Um, when he had finished everything, he realized that he didn't have a name for the town. And so he wrote on there, name, and he put a question mark. But he had really bad handwriting. So the people saw the map and they saw where he wrote name and thought it said gnome. And so they went, yeah, yeah, sure, that, that works. And so the town was named Gnome. Um, for several, several years, I believed that Gnome was a native word. There are a lot of towns up in Alaska named for native words. Um, Bethel, which is at the top of Alaska, very far into the Arctic Circle, um, was recently renamed Unilakleet, um, which is a, a native word. Um, so there's, there's towns all over Alaska that do have native names. And then there's other towns that you can tell they came into being as a result of gold rushes. Um, places like Dead Horse, which is very far north. I think it's just barely past the Arctic Circle. It's right before you hit Bethel. Um, there's also Chicken um, on Alaska is one is a town in, in the Aleutian Change in the Aleutian Chain. But then you also have places like Sitka and other various places. Um, the town origins up here have, of course, their own wild little stories that go along with it. But Nome in particular was one that I wanted to make sure we touched on because it was just, as a local legend, it's so weird. And of course, we're going to continue to keep touching on Nome because this is where we see the beginning of the uh, the Iditarod. So in 1925 in Nome, children were co contracting diphtheria. Um, it it was killing a lot of the, the children. They needed a serum to be sent to Nome to save the children. In order to do that, a bunch of dog sled uh, runners from Ninana, which is right around where Fairbanks is at, um, decided that they were going to uh, kind of relay the uh, 
the serum out to Gnome because it was very far away and this isn't like we don't have I'm trying to think um, it was considered to be the fastest way to do it a lot of the last in places are places where it's like in order to access it you either need a plane or you need somebody to do a dog run like this um, so it was decided that in Ninana they would set from Ninana they would send the serum to arrive in Nome by dog sled. This of course is later on immortalized in the Iditarod, which every year goes from Anchorage and clear on up into Nome where the finish line is. The total distance is around a thousand one hundred miles. Um, during the epidemic, uh, this was split up, and it was also a lot smaller. <laughs> uh, the run from Nianana to Nome is not nearly as long as the run from Anchorage to Nome, because Anchorage is much farther south. Um, so the Iditarod race is considered one of the more grueling races for dog sledders, simply because it's really, really long. And of course, we had dogs that were immortalized on the trail. Everyone knows Balto. He's one of the best known dogs for the Iditarod. He would run the last leg of the race. Um, he ran the last leg of the race, but it's disputed whether or not he was actually on the team. Um, no one actually ever saw Balto as the lead dog for the team. Uh, there's discussions as to whether or not Balto was on the team at all. Um, some people have said that if he was on the dog team at all, he was co-leading with another dog named Fox. Uh, Balto, Balto's owner never won a dog race with him either, and just referred to him as a scrub dog. He was, he was a, like a, a dog that you would just kind of have wasn't really particularly good at running races. Now the lesser known dogs of the run was Togo, which I believe is actually in the Disney movie. I think they have Togo be the bad guy in the movie. He's like the really big dog that like runs the team. But Togo is actually responsible for pulling a majority of the distance and through some of the more dangerous areas of the run. Um, I believe at one point they end up running over a, a lake, which was unfortunately not super thick at the time, and they had to get across before uh, the lake falls through. Um, so he ended up running 100 or 260 miles through the most dangerous portions of the run. And after a few more races, Togo was retired and he became a breed dog so that he, they could pass his genes on. Um, don't, don't take this as, oh, well, Balto was, was worthless or anything like that. Every dog and musher that was on this run were heroes in their own right because the places they were going through were incredibly dangerous and they were doing it in the winter where Alaska is very unforgiving. Um, every single, it is argued, it is very arguable that all of the dogs, regardless of how sturdy they were, were heroes in their own right. So we have one last story that we're going to talk about um, for the lecture today. Uh, we're going to be going over Mr. John Smith, a territorial governor for the state. So he's going to be the second territorial governor for the state of uh, for the territory of Alaska. Um, he s gets his start in Nome as a journalist. Uh, he was covering politics at the time. Uh, he, he was later on, and this is going to be a wild jump, later on he is appointed territorial governor by Woodrow Wilson. It's, there's entire stories that go on between what happens with him being a journalist 
and and then making it in his way into politics but that's not the focus of our story today so he he was in office for five years as territorial governor however his wife would find out that he because he and his wife did not get along um he ran away from her without telling her and came to alaska as a way of trying to escape her um eventually word would get back to her that he was the governor for the territory of alaska um she would then call the uh to call the U.S. government later on and inform them that he was in fact a Canadian and was never naturalized. So he was a Canadian citizen. Um, after this is found out, he wasn't reinstated as the governor the next time around by Woodrow Wilson. Now, this has been a very quick look at the state. Um, this just touches the surface of what there is to be uh, discussed in the state we're not like um case in point the little things that i've left out things like uh the formation of the native corporations discovery of oil um the oil spill during the shoot i want to say like the 1980s um these are all great stories that come with the state there's so much to be learned in this particular this particular state that there is a full college course on it that I particular I actually took in order to make sure that I was getting proper information when I was getting tours of the Capitol building. I highly recommend going through and learning some of these stories because they are really interesting. Um, there's books about men who during world war ii get lost um they're they're really good story okay see you later Crypsis. have a good time make sure you kill lots of zombies um this this state has a lot of history to offer and so if this is something that you that maybe it whet your appetite a little bit i really recommend going through and looking for some of the books on in stories on things that happen in alaska there's a, a very good story um i can't i couldn't find the title of it um but it was about a gentleman who was a pilot during world war ii who ends up crash landing his plane out in the middle of nowhere in Alaska and had to walk all the way back to the army base. And the entire time he's fighting the elements, he's fighting off uh, animals, uh, making his way back to the base. And when they, he actually gets back, he's actually in better health than he was before he took off. Um, The history of this state is very diverse and I highly recommend doing some research on your own or if you really liked this particular uh, stream let me know so that I can continue to I I would like to continue to do lectures like these um, on my Twitter I already posted that I'm looking at doing another lecture series next month um, so far it looks like it's gonna end up being about vampires which is more my wheelhouse um, so if this is something that you like, please, by all means, let me know and share it around so that more people can be involved. And of course, a quick bibliography of all the stuff. Um, if you would like to learn more about the Iditarod in particular, they have an entire website that goes over the history of the race and shows like when it starts when it ends who's running and things like that but that actually wraps up our lecture for today um if anybody has any questions they'd like to go over before by all means feel free to type them out other than that class is pretty much dismissed
Whew. There's there's so much about this state that is worth reading about, and I would actually like to to do more uh, studies and deep dives into this state. Um, I really want lectures to become a really big thing for us. So, yeah, um, that about wraps up the lecture. If anybody has any questions, feel free to message me. Um, I will be around for. Uh, office hours of course and beyond that we're good to go and I I my streaming computer is almost up and running again the biggest problem as I said is my internet is really wonky so getting a good stream out of it is gonna be very difficult for a little while but my job should be wrapping up here within the next few weeks so I'll be back someplace again where I will have adequate internet and can start streaming video games again. Um, if there are any games you would like to see, please feel free to message me. Um, I'm always looking for something to play. Um, but other than that, I'm going to go ahead and take off. Uh, I hope everybody...